and let's get going. So, guys, gals, when we talk about anatomical position, it's all about clear communication. We need to communicate clearly with each other, especially in healthcare settings, so that you don't chop off the wrong body parts, so that you don't replace the wrong appendage, and stuff like that has happened. I've had a bunch of knee surgeries, and before every knee surgery, the surgeons told me to take a permanent marker and write yes and no on the knee that should be operated on and the knee that should not be operated on. Because guess what? Somebody made that mistake. Um, so in anatomical position, this is our standard frame of reference. So you stand straight, toes forward, palms forward, thumbs outward. This is our frame of reference for anatomical position. Now, within anatomical position, there's some directional terminology. So, for instance, in anatomical position, anterior is facing forward with anatomical position. Posterior is backwards. When we look at superior, inferior, superior is up with an anatomical position, inferior is down with an anatomical position. And our frame of reference, truly within anatomical position, it's all about the torso. So up relative to the torso, down relative to the torso. But you're noticing right now that I'm moving my arms. My appendages are undulating a lot right now relative to my torso. So terms like superior and inferior for appendages, just, they just aren't very descriptive. Because right now, you know, my hand is superior to my elbow, but now my hand is inferior to my elbow. So which is it? Is the hand inferior? Is the hand superior? We don't want selective directional terminology. So when we look at appendages, guys, gals, we're going to use a different term, proximal and distal. And this is all based on how close it is to the point of attachment. So if we look at my arm, the point of attachment for my arm to the trunk or its origin, where it starts, is going to be my shoulder. And if we look now, my fingers that I'm wiggling right now, they are the farthest thing on my arm from my shoulder. My elbow's kind of in between. I could say that my fingers are distal relative to my elbow because they are farther away from the point of attachment. Or I could turn that around. I could say my elbow is proximal relative to my fingers based on that point of attachment. And the same could be true for the leg or you, know, you make an argument for the head being an appendage. Um, that's open to debate. And even within the body, things like, you know, the appendix. The appendix is a little appendage that comes off of the cecum of the large intestine. Or you could think of your finger as an appendage that comes off of your hand. This proximal distal terminology applies to any projection, any structure that juts out on our bodies. And then finally, we have superficial and deep. Superficial and deep are closer to the surface or farther from the surface. So to recap, here's the classic figure. I've used this figure for six years now uh, for directional terminology. We have all the terms we just talked about. Notice, guys, gals, with left, right. And I mixed this up in lab. I caught myself yesterday, but I still mixed myself up in lab yesterday. Left and right are so easy to get mixed up. We need to have a patient-centered point of view. So when I'm working with a model, when I'm working with a torso model or a cadaver or a patient, I always need to reverse left and right. My, if it's on my right side, it's its left side. So if you need to, like, during a lab exam, hold up your fingers, you know, left, right, and then flip it around, you got to do what you got to do to get it right. So help me out here. How is the belly button located 
relative to the nose. Is it inferior to the nose or is it something else? So this is going to be a true false question. Let's put this into practice. We have about 20 seconds left. You no pressure, 10 seconds. The correct answer is true. The belly button, it, or the navel, is inferior to our nose. And it looks like most of us were able to nail that. Great work. Let's talk about how we can make a slice through the body. There are different ways that you can look at organs, look at cadaver models, look at torso models. In your textbook, you have a bunch of really excellent photos of cadavers that have been sliced. And if it shows a slice right down the middle versus a slice that gives you a top bottom piece versus a slice that gives you a superior or an anterior posterior piece. Those different slices have different names. So let's talk about a frontal plane. Frontal is the term that's used in your textbook. The old school term for a frontal plane is coronal. And it still shows up every once in a while. For instance, in the skull, we have the coronal suture which is along a frontal plane slice through the cranium. When we think of a frontal plane, this is a plane or a slice that gives you an anterior posterior piece. So if you cut something and you get a front back piece, that's a frontal plane giving you a front and a back piece. We also have transverse planes. If it goes from side to side, transverse, it's a transverse plane. Those transverse planes, um, there's an empty seat right there if you want a seat to sit in. Um, that transverse plane is going to give you a superior, inferior piece. Now, a common question I get is, hey, hey, does it have to be exactly in the middle? Do these pieces have to be exactly even? And the answer is no. You can have uneven slices. It's kind of like when you were, you're supposed to share like a piece of cake with your siblings and you're like, okay, I'll cut it in half and one half was way bigger than the other half. You can have uneven slices through the body. Oh goodness. Um, with the sagittal slice that gives you left and right, that sagittal slice if it's an uneven slice, an uneven left-right, it's just purely sagittal. And that uneven left-right slice is almost never used. Because, um, you know, it's just human tendency. Most of us have just a little bit of OCD built into us. So if, I, if we're going to cut something in half, we like to cut it in half kind of in the middle so we get even halves. And it's just more satisfying that way. And in your textbooks, and when you buy organs, and just almost universally, we get even left-right pieces. And if we have it right down the middle to give us even left-right pieces, it's on the mid-line. And that slice down the mid-line is going to be called a mid-sagittal slice. And that's going to be the most common slice. So, as we take a look here, we can see some different slices. So, in figure A, we have a mid-sagittal slice. So, the textbook wasn't very specific when they labeled that figure. That's a mid-sagittal slice to the female's abdominal pelvic cavity. In figure B, we have a frontal or coronal slice through the thoracic cavity. And then in figure C, we have a transverse slice through the cranium. Next, we have regional terminology. 
And we're not going to spend a lot of time on all of the regions of the human body here in lecture. That was primarily covered during lab. But I just wanted to quick put these figures on your PowerPoint presentation so that you had access to them because I know that figure in your textbook wasn't, or your lab manual, wasn't necessarily the best figure. So while you're studying for lab and you're trying to learn about regions of the body for lab, you can download this PowerPoint and use this slide to help reinforce those regions of the body while you're studying for your lab quiz next week or your lab exam in a couple weeks. Something that's used frequently is the region of nine, or the abdominal pelvic regions. And these abdominal pelvic regions are used to organize the abdominal pelvic cavity so that we can find um, approximations, or we can approximate where the pain is in the patient, or where something has happened within the patient's body. Now, just like in your geometry class that you took as a probably a sophomore or freshman in high school, we need a reference point. And our reference point, or our zero, zero, if we like Cartesian coordinates, is going to be the umbilical, or the belly button, or the navel. And that region right in the middle is known as the umbilical region. And then as we move directly above the umbilical region, the region above that is called epigastric. Epi is a root word that means above. This is a good thing to scribble in the margin notes. Um, I'm a huge fan of root words because I don't have enough brain power to brute force memorize every single vocabulary word in existence. It's much easier on your brain if you learn the meaning of the syllables in the words, and then when you get to the vocabulary word, you can just piece it together on the fly. So epi means above, gastric is a technical term for stomach. So epigastric is the top of the stomach region. And in our regions of nine, it's located above the umbilical. Beneath the umbilical region, we have the hypogastric region. Hypo meaning beneath or below gastric meaning stomach. So the bottom of your stomach is the hypogastric region. The top of your stomach is the epigastric region. Right in the middle by the umbilical, or where the umbilical cord was, is the umbilical region. And then we have the lumbar and the iliac and then the hypochondriac regions. And I always get mixed up, and I still think it in my head right now. Whenever I see the left hypochondriac or the right hypochondriac, I think of people who think they're sick all the time. That is not what we mean when we say hypochondriac. In this context, hypo means below, chondro means cartilage. And right now, take your fingers, palpate the bottom of your rib cage. It's really flexible. That's because there's hyaline cartilage right there. And right below the cartilage is the hypochondriac region. So we have left hypochondriac, right hypochondriac, and then we, beneath that, or inferior to the hypochondriac regions, we have the lumbar regions. Those lumbar regions correspond to the lumbar vertebrae. Um, really good chairs for those of you who are into ergonomic support and posture. You know that a good chair has lumbar support. And when we think of lumbar, think of the lower back area. So this area directly lateral to the, epiga to the umbilical region, left, right, lateral to the umbilical region is the left, right, lumbar regions. And then moving inferior, as we keep moving down, you can put your fingers on your hip bones. And that's going to be in the iliac region. So we're going to have the left iliac, and then we're going to have the right iliac. And that's the nine regions. Now, depending on the textbook, sometimes there's a slightly different term used for those different regions. 
but those are the terms that are most common. So let's go back to body planes. If we have a body plane that gives you exactly equal left and right pieces, so the left and right pieces are the same size, what kind of a body plane is that? What kind of a slice was that? Was it coronal, transverse, sagittal, frontal, or mid-sagittal? We have about 10 seconds. The correct answer was mid-sagittal E. And it looks like we did fantastic as a class. Nicely done. Um, this table is in here for reference. Um, let's talk about the body cavities. This also was mirrored in lab. Um, hopefully you've had this activity already in lab, but it's worth reinforcing. What are the main cavities of the body? And I couldn't help but smile to myself that your textbook now has omitted dorsal and ventral cavities. They aren't in the textbook anymore. They're still in the lab manual, but give it a couple additions, they'll probably go away too. So when we look at the cavities that house your central nervous system, we have the brain in the cranial cavity, and then going inferior from the brain, leading down from the brain, we have the spinal cord and the vertebrae. And those spinal cord and vertebrae are going to be in the vertebral column. And then we're going to have cavities that are more anterior. These cavities that are more anterior are two large cavities with some subdivisions. We have the thoracic cavity, and when we think thoracic cavity, think chest. And there's a dividing line. It's going to be the diaphragm, a muscle that you use to inhale, to breathe in. And that diaphragm is a sheet of muscle that goes from left to right across the torso. So because it goes from left to right, it transverses your torso, separating your thoracic cavity from the cavity that's underneath. And the cavity that's inferior to the thoracic cavity is the abdominopelvic cavity. Let's spend some time talking about the thoracic cavity. Within the thoracic cavity, there are two subcavities, two primary subcavities. Those two primary subcavities are the pleural cavity, and when we think plural, you should scribble in your notes, lungs. Plural is the technical term for lungs. One that's not in the figure, that didn't make it into this figure, is the mediastinum cavity, sometimes also pronounced mediastinum. That was in your lab objective sheet, and it was in your lab manual, though. And that mediastinum or mediastinum cavity is in between the pleural cavities. It's medial to the lungs. It's the space in between the lungs. So that would be a good thing to write in the margins on this slide, the mediastinum. And then finally, there is the pericardial cavity. The pericardial cavity is a subcavity within the mediastinum cavity. So when we think thoracic cavity, there's three cavities within it. We have the pleural and the mediastinum, and then within the mediastinum, the pericardial. So let's move on to the abdominal pelvic cavity. When we look at that abdominal pelvic cavity, it's really a merger of two cavities, the abdominal cavity and then the pelvic cavity. 
That pelvic cavity corresponds to the pelvic region that you were studying in lab, that superficial region that kind of makes a C. You go across, you transverse by the navel, and then swoop down to make a C for the pelvic region on the surface. And directly deep to that pelvic region is the pelvic cavity. And all of that corresponds to the bony structure known as the pelvis. Yeah, I know, they sound all very similar to each other. Another old school name for the abdominal pelvic cavity is the peritoneal cavity. And when we get to A and P2, when we talk about the digestive system, there's some membranes, a special membrane known as the peritoneal membrane or the peritoneum. Um, that's still some of that old language that hasn't been phased out yet for easy to understand more modern terms. So, if we like pictures, here's some pictures reinforcing those cavities of the body, where we have, within the thoracic cavity, the pleural cavities in teal, the pericardial cavity in purple, and the mediastinum doesn't have a color denoting it, but it's the space in between the teal pleural cavities. As we look at the abdominal pelvic cavity, it can be broken up into the pink abdominal and the yellow pelvic cavities. I need to emphasize this again. The diaphragm is not a cavity of the body. I usually have a good chunk of my students that see diaphragm on the figure with body cavities and think, oh, everything on this must be a cavity of the body. The one thing on this picture that's not a cavity is our diaphragm. That's a dividing landmark separating the thoracic from the abdominal pelvic cavities. To reinforce lab some more, we have serosa in our bodies. These serosa or membranes of our bodies help to differentiate or separate cavities from each other. We're not going to spend a lot of time on serous membranes in bio 214, but we'll spend a significant chunk of time talking about them in bio 314. So let's just introduce them briefly right now. When we look, think of a serous membrane, guys, gals, it's a double layered membrane. It's one continuous membrane that's folded over on itself to form two layers. So it's one continuous sheet folded to make two layers. The inner layer has the root word visceral associated with it. Visceral traditionally has a word that is associated with the organs. So when you think of the visceral serosa, that's going to be the inner layer pressed directly against the organ. We could have the visceral pleura, the visceral pericardium, so on and so forth. We also have the outer membrane. That outer membrane is more superficial and presses directly against the partition or the wall of the cavity. And that's going to be known as the parietal layer or the pari serosa, parietal serosa. So when we think of the heart and the lungs, we would have the parietal pleura, which is the membrane that presses against the outside of the thoracic cavity. Or we could have the parietal pericardium, the outer membrane that presses against the edge of the pericardial cavity. Why is it important to have serous membranes? We have these serous membranes to help compartmentalize things within our bodies. And it's good to have divisions. Yesterday we talked about characteristics of life. And one of the characteristics of life we talked about yesterday was compartmentalization. We have different regions within our cells, different regions within our bodies, where we have different kinds of chemistry occurring. And if we really think about it, we're nothing but a lot of chemical reactions. And then finally, we have organ systems of our bodies. In lab, when we talked about the organ systems, I wanted you to focus primarily on naming the organ system and then naming the major organs of that organ system. Here in lecture, we're going to focus on the function of those organ systems. So first, we have the integumentary system. The primary function of our integumentary system is going to be protection. It protects our bodies. 
What does it protect our bodies against? It protects our bodies against invaders. There are billions of bacterium and microorganisms that try to get into your body every single day. It also protects you against dehydration or fluid loss. We are terrestrial animals, and since we don't live in swimming pools or lakes or ponds, we need to keep liquids in our bodies. We find that with burn victims that lose a good chunk of their integumentary system, one of the major complications of having third degree burns is going to be massive dehydration because they can't keep that fluid in their bodies anymore. Some other functions of our integumentary system include thermal regulation. You know, let, let's face it, we're all probably kind of cold today. So we've had the goosebumps, we've been shivering a little tiny bit. And that's okay. That's part of our integumentary system, giving us some thermoregulation. We also have our skeletal system. Our skeletal system's primary function is going to be support, structural support for our bodies. It also is the attachment point of our skeletal muscle system, so it allows us to move. If we didn't have our skeleton, it'd be really hard for us to walk around and move. There'd be nothing for our muscles to push against. Or, ex excuse me, I misspoke there. There'd be nothing for our muscles to pull against because muscles only pull, they never push. Our skeletal system has some secondary functions that are also really important. For instance, we store calcium, we store phosphorus, and we store other minerals within our skeletal system. Um, for individuals that have heavy metal poisoning, one of the ways our bodies cope with heavy metal poisonings is we take those heavy metals and we sequester them in the dense tissue of our skeletal system to remove those heavy metals from circulation. Now, consequently, this means that if you do have heavy metal poisoning, you can find that forensically within the skeletal system, but I'm trying to stay on task, so I'm not going to talk about forensic science right now. So let's talk about the muscular system. Um, it's really straightforward. The main purpose of the muscular system is movement. And I said it earlier, but I'll say it again. Our muscles in our bodies can pull. And by pulling on something, they generate movement within our bodies. There are different kinds of muscles. We have cardiac, smooth, and skeletal muscles. But the unifying theme of all of these muscles of our muscular system is that they generate movement by pulling. A key secondary function of our muscular system is they generate body heat. As these muscles are moving, there's lots of friction generated and there's lots of secondary lost energy that's waste energy that we use as heat. Our next organ system is the lymphatic system. When we think of the lymphatic or immune system, I want you to think of fluid management. We need a way to manage the extracellular fluid in our bodies, that fluid that builds up in our tissues. And to get rid of that extra fluid that builds up in our tissues, we have the lymphatic system that will shunnel or funnel away that extra fluid so that it can be processed and urinated out of the body. Another key function of our lymphatic or immune system is that it monitors the body for pathogens or microorganisms that don't necessarily belong in our bodies. And it aids us with our immune response to fight off disease, to help maintain that homeostatic balance. Our next body system is the respiratory system. The primary function of the respiratory system is gas exchange, gas exchange. We want to add oxygen to the bloodstream, and we want to remove carbon dioxide from the bloodstream. Some secondary functions of our respiratory system include monitoring blood pH, and you'll love the respiratory system in Bio314. We spend a good chunk of time grinding some chemical equations on acid-base balance and blood buffering. I find it personally very interesting. When we look at our next body system, we have the urinary system. And for our urinary system, it's going to focus primarily on filtering the blood and fluid management of the body. We remove waste products from the bloodstream with our urinary system, 
And then we also manage our body's fluid levels with the urinary system. If we don't have enough fluid in our body, our urinary system will concentrate our urine and our urine becomes darker and more yellow in appearance as our urinary system helps us to conserve liquid. If we drink too much water and we have too much water in our bodies, an excess of water, our urinary system compensates by diluting our urine and causing us to urinate more. It's all about maintaining balance or that relatively constant internal environment. A secondary function of our urinary system is going to be regulating blood, red blood cell concentrations. And that's one that we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about, but our urinary system helps us to regulate the concentration of red blood cells in our bodies. Our next body system is the nervous system. When we think of the nervous system, I want you to think of processing information and quickly transmitting information. We process information with our nervous system and we transmit signals quickly with our nervous system. And I need to emphasize quickly transmitting signals in our bodies because there's another, there's another body system that does it slowly. Our next body system is the adrenal, excuse me, the endocrine system. And as we look at the endocrine system, that's the body system that transmits information slowly. Our nervous system transmits information quickly using electric signals. Our endocrine system will transmit information slowly using hormonal signals. So we'll have protein or steroid-based hormones within the endocrine system, slowly transmitting information throughout the body. And just for a frame of reference, with the nervous system, it's typically less than a second. With the endocrine system, for a scale of time, we're looking at seconds to minutes to hours, depending on the hormone for transmitting that information. Our next body system is the cardiovascular system. Cardio is a root word for heart. Vascular refers to tubes. In our body, the cardiovascular system is the heart and the blood vessels. Its primary function is to move nutrients through the body. Our cardiovascular system is the delivery system. It's the UPS of our bodies. It moves supplies around and it moves waste products around within our bodies. That is the same thing. Good question. The circulatory system is the same thing as the cardiovascular system. Up next, we have the digestive system. Its primary function is going to be to process food and allow us to absorb nutrients and then get rid of unwanted food products. So when we think of the digestive system, it allows us to take that food that we eat, break it apart into its individual building blocks, and then we absorb what we need from the food and get rid of what we don't want from the food. So the digestive system is processing food to absorb nutrients and remove unwanted products. And then finally, the last system is the reproductive system. Our reproductive system is focused primarily on the continuation of our species, making progeny. So when we look at males and females, there's a slightly different emphasis between the genders for the reproductive system. When we look at the male sex, males are going to be focused primarily on the delivery of sperm. And when we look at the female reproductive system, the female reproductive system focuses primarily on the incubation of the embryo and then providing milk or nutrients to the newborn child or the small infant. Questions, comments on the systems of the body? All right, well, that is it for our body systems. And we're going to shift gears and focus on chemistry.